Good afternoon. Uh, this is Dr. Bob Stark today, uh, and this is Lecture 5, String Operations for CS1302. Now, uh, we talked some about strings in CS1, and, you know, strings may seem to be a boring thing, and, and the reality is they're not. They, we, there's a rich body of, of operations we can do on them, um, and more importantly, um, we do a lot of string processing um, in, in the, our various programming activities. Um, and they're not trivial things to do. So um, I want to disavow you right up ahead if this is some, something that's just kind of pedestrian and boring. There's a lot of, uh, of interesting things that go on in this. And um, part of why we, we have a, a lecture devoted to it in, in CS2, which is uh, more advanced stuff. All right. so. Outline today. Uh, last class we talked about text-based input-output. We looked at uh, the file class, which encapsulates information about the file. Uh, we looked at the scanner class, which is very useful for parsing through the file um, and, and, and pulling out, um, uh, opening a file for reading and, and pulling information out of it. And we looked at the print writer uh, class, which is very good for doing the opposite, opening a file for writing and um, writing information to a, to a file we've opened. Um, today, as I said, we're going to be looking at string objects themselves um, and some of the, the operations we can perform on the object directly, um, as well as uh, something called regular expressions, which are uh, a very useful mini programming language for um, matching patterns within strings. And last, we'll be looking at formatting the output. This is beyond the string dot format you may have looked at in CS1. Uh, we have some, some other classes that uh, do some very useful and specific kinds of things that we're going to talk about. So a review of stuff you may remember from CS1. A, a string is a sequence of characters, and we have an example there. My string, my string equals this lesson is about string. And we have uh, double quotes, which, by the way, these are technically smart quotes. Uh, let's see if we can get rid of those. Unfortunately, the Microsoft Office puts them in. You should have the straight quotes like that. The, the, the slanted quotes are technically a different character and will um, affect your code if you put them in. Uh, Java won't recognize them as quote characters. Um, the character positions are numbered starting at zero. So our capital T is position zero. Our lowercase h is position one. Our lowercase i is position two. Lowercase s, position three the space is position 4, and so, and so on. And we can iterate through those characters. So here we have a standard for loop. Starts at 0, goes up to but not including the length of the string. And we can enumerate uh, specific characters of the string using the char at position or index uh, there. And the, and the char at gives us a char data type back. Uh, we also would have looked at escape sequences in CS1. And escape sequences are two characters visually that represent a single character inside our program. Uh, escape sequences always start with the backslash. The backslash says what comes next is a, a special character. So the one we probably use the most was backslash in which we used to represent the new line character. There are others we may have spoken about. Uh, backslash T is a tab character. Backslash backslash is what we use if we need an actual backslash in our string. Uh, there are others, backslash R, backslash F. Uh, we use backslashes to um, indicate single and double quotes within our, our strings, um, various things like that. Most of the time, it's back, backslash n and slash slash itself that are the ones we use the most, as, as well as the quote ones. Some string methods. Uh, again, some of these should be uh, review. So using our example, my string, this is a lesson about string. Uh, some methods of note this is the char at, which we already talked about. Uh, feed it a number, and it gives us the character at that specified position. So we can get the first letter of our string here by my string dot char at zero, and that would give us the um, 
character, capital T. And again, it should be straight, single quotes, and not the slanty bits that we had before. Length will get a, give us the number of characters in the string, if you've seen that before. Substring will give us part of the string. So we give it a start position, and optionally, that's what the brackets mean here, an end position. If you give substring just the start position, it will give you all characters from that index to the end. If you give it a start position and an end position, it will give you all the characters from start position up to but not including end position. So for example, if we do my string dot substring two four, it will actually give us the characters at position two and position three, which zero one two three are the will be what comes out of that. And there you have it. Two lowercase, two uppercase, they, they take the string and either change it to all lowercase or to all uppercase as, as appropriate. And then we can compare strings. Dot equals method lets you one string dot equals another and will return true if they have the exact same characters. And it is case sensitive because a capital T is different from a lowercase t. Those are two different characters. If you want to, to do so without um, worrying about case, it does have an equals ignores case method. Uh, I think internally it either does two lowercase on everything or two uppercase on everything. But it, it will do a, a case insen insensitive compare. Once again, refreshing from CS1, never use equals equals to compare strings. It will not work the way you think it does. In Java, equals equals on object types like string will uh, only return true if both sides are the exact same object. If you have two strings that have the same characters but are different objects, um, it will return false with a very corner case exception that we won't go into right now. Just assume it will return false. Always use dot equals or dot equals ignores case to, to compare strings. Uh, now, you will encounter situations where you need to convert another data type uh, to a string. Any type can be converted using the toString method. Now, we for uh, any class that we write, we can make sure that it has a toString method included, and that will, will help us um, help us out here. Uh, in this situation, we're looking at integers, which automatically have a two-string uh, method. And this is integer the class, not int the primitive. Um, and we can use that to convert from the integer to the string. So for example, if we have this value object um, variable of type big I integer, which we just made it uh, you know, we built it out of this int here using the value of method. Um, we can get its string by calling its two string method. And we can do this for a lot of different uh, primitives. Double's going to have something similar, as will char, uh, uh, well, capital C character in, in this case, uh, capital B boolean, um, all those will have, have a, a two string that simply returns a string representation of that primitive. Now, we're used to doing this simply by um, uh, just uh, adding it onto the end of a string. And I can show you a, as a quick and dirty uh, version of that. So if we have a string, um, we can also stringify an integer like that. And this is what's happening in the background when we do something. Um, actually, this is what's happening in the background when we do this. It's just this makes it a little easier in some cases. You've seen this version before. This is what's actually happening uh, when we do that. More interesting is, is taking something that looks like a number uh, or looks like a, a Boolean, true or false, 
and converting that into a string. So if we have a file with one, two on a line, those are a string. They're not going to be a number. They're going to be the, the character one followed by the character two. When we're reading that in, we probably want to uh, use it and manipulate it as, a, as an integer. So we're using our scanner, we call next line, let's assume next line gives us the string one, two. We want to convert that into an integer so we can use the static method of the integer class called parse int, pass our string to it, which in this case is again is the string one followed by a two. That will convert it into an actual integer for us here. Um, Scanner.nextInt will, will combine these two steps uh, as well. So we can do, do it either way. Make sure that the string we're parsing does not contain white space. Uh, most of the, uh, a very common situation is there will be white space either at the beginning or at the end. So we want to use the trim uh, method to get rid of that. So we take our line, dot trim, then parse in that. So there are parse methods on all of our um, primitive types using their associated object types. So big I integer has a parse int method that will uh, parse an integer out. If the string does not contain a parsable int or is null, uh, this will return number format exception. For doubles, we have a parse double from string. Again, it will try to it will attempt to pull out something that looks like a double value from that string. And this will work for things like 3.14. It'll also work for things like uh, 5e to the minus 10. You know, the, the, it'll, it'll parse anything like that. Um, again, throws null pointer exception of null for a, a null string, number format exception if it does not contain a parsable double. Uh, we can do also do a similar thing for parse boolean. Basically works if uh, you know, string dot lowercase is equal to true. Otherwise, it will give us false, um, even if the, even if it's something other than false. That's an interesting one to remember. Okay, in this part, we're looked. We're taking a string, and we're seeing if it has a certain pattern of characters inside of it. We we're searching through it to see if it, if it contains something of interest. Um, some examples uh, of what we might do is see if a string only contains digits or see if a string contains very specific digits like a valid student ID, which must start with 917 and then has six more digits that can be anything 0 through 9. Um, or maybe it is a pattern that looks like uh, a date where you have two digits for the month, a slash, two digits for the year, a slash, and four digits, sorry, two digits for the month, slash, two digits for the day, slash, two, four digits for the year. Um, or it could be something that represents a monetary value, so maybe has a dollar sign, followed by the dollars, followed by a decimal, followed by um, two digits for the cents. Or maybe it's an email address that has a name, followed by the at sign, followed by um, WestGA followed by a dot followed by a dot edu. Another anything anything like that. So we want to check to see if the characters are arranged in a specific pattern or adhere to a specific format. Um, if we're doing this uh, one, with our characters one by one, or what I would say, if we're trying to do this by hand and roll our own, this can get very cumbersome. Um, and so we have a a tool at our disposal called regular expressions. Um, and, and the bullet, po bullet point here says a regular expression is a search pattern that represents a set of strings. What I like to think of it is it is a small language in and of itself that lets us describe a pattern uh, that we want to match within strings or a class of strings that we want to, to match. And I, I should note that regular expressions are not unique to Java. 
these same regular expression concepts that I'm, that we're talking about today, honestly, the same patterns that we, we develop today can be used in just about any programming language. Um, they're, they're the same regular expressions come out in, in Python and Ruby, C Sharp. Again, I, I've not met, met a programming language yet that did not use have these available in some form or fashion. Uh, and here we have some examples. So the first is a string. Uh, it's something that matches all strings that consist of exactly four digits. So we have slash D, slash D, slash D, slash D, where each slash D says match a digit. So anything zero through nine. We could have something that matches all strings of the form January followed by two digits. So anything that's like January 01, January 12, and so forth. Um, and it would look like what you see there, the literal string January, followed by a space, followed by slash D, slash D for the two digits. Now note, this would not match January 1. This, this particular pattern requires there to be exactly two digits. Also, this pattern would match January 45. It doesn't have any... Um, what, as it's written, it doesn't have any way to check that the the, the day is between 01 and 31 uh, inclusive. Third bullet point, we have a way to represent all the dates of MMDDYYY. Notice that we the digits are separated by the forward slashes, which will be matched literally. Um, next bullet, we have all strings that consist of a single lowercase letter. So the square brackets with A through Z inside says it will match any single letter A through Z. And then the last one is all strings that consist of any number of lowercase letters only. So we take that A through Z and we put what's called a quantifier on it that says match zero or more of these things. So technically that last bullet point would match the empty string as well. And you have some, um, some tutorials and, and some documentation links there for dealing with Java's regular expressions. Okay, so let's start with some specifics. These are what we call character classes. So broad ranges of, of related characters that we have shorthands to talk about. So the first one is the 0-9 inside of brackets. So that rep that particular um, representation says match any single digit. It doesn't match the brackets. They, those represent um, you know, where the character class itself. So it matches any digit 0 through 9 uh, without the brackets. The next one is any lowercase letter. So A-Z followed by the one after that is any uppercase letter capital A-Z. So anything in between those two gets matched. Um, then we can start combining character classes. So we have uh, lowercase a to z, uppercase a to z inside a, a, a character class. And we can even do some mixing and matching. So the next one that shows 1, 2, 3, x, y, z underscore says that any single character of 1, 2, 3, x, y, z or underscore will match. And only those things. Um, the dot character or the period character um, in, a, in a regular expression will match any single character. And then that last last character class is an example of how to do a, a negated class. So inside bracket square brackets like there that if we have a caret followed by some characters it matches any character other than those listed. So this would match any character other than a, b, or c in lowercase. And those last two examples show how we can start combining bits of, of a regular expression. So we have the character class ABC followed by the character class 1, 2, 3. So what that will match is any lowercase ABC followed by any lowercase 1, 2, 3. So for example, A1 would match, as would A2, as would A3, or C1, or C2. Any of those would match. BC3 would not. So, uh, the last bullet point, we can have any of B, C, R, followed by A, T. 
and it matches the the strings bat, cat, or rat. Most uh, implementations of regular expressions will have some have some predefined character classes, and these exist simply to make your um, regular expressions uh, a little more concise. So as, as we mentioned before, uh, the dot matches any character. Slash lowercase d, sorry, backslash lowercase d matches any digit, 0 through 9. Backslash uppercase d is anything other than a digit. So it represents the character class caret 0 through 9. Backslash s represents a white space character. So any of these characters shown in the brackets will also include a, a regular space as well. Uh, backslash du uh, lowercase w is anything lowercase a to z, uppercase a to z, underscore, or 0 to 9. We call those word characters. Um, backslash uppercase w is anything else. So, as a question, what does character class slash backslash d plus backslash d match? And the answer is it matches any digit or the plus symbol. And in fact, the two backslash d's are, um, um, are, are redundant here. Next up are the, the idea of quantifiers. So any regular expression, whether it's a, a single or compound or whatever, can be followed by what's called a quantifier. So if we have a regular expression followed by a, a question mark, it means the thing that precedes the question mark happens zero or one times. So for example, if we have slash D it, followed by a question mark, it would match the empty string, or it would match a single zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, a single digit. we can have a, a regular expression followed by an asterisk. The asterisk says it occurs zero or more times. So, for example, if we had lowercase a followed by an asterisk, it would match um, the empty string. It would match a. It would match aa, aaa, aaaa, or a thousand a's all in a row. We have a regular expression followed by a plus. It's similar, except that the empty string is not matched. So we'd have to have at least one thing. We can be more specific with things by using curly braces. So x followed by uh, a number in curly brace says it must happen exactly that many times. So if we have an a, fall, or uh, use the shown here, if we have a slash d followed by a three in curly brackets, it, m it will only match three digit numbers. It would match 000, zero, zero. it would match 101, zero, one. it would match 255, five. it would not match 5. And the last one lets us uh, define a range of, of values that are acceptable. So, for example, if we have the numer uh, digit or a character followed by 2, 4 in curly braces, it would match 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, or 1, 1, 1, 1. few other things to, to pay attention to here. If we want to match a character like um, question mark or uh, asterisk or a plus or the curly braces or the square braces or a dot or anything like that, things that are actually part of the regular expression language, we can simply precede them with a backslash and they are interpreted as the, those literal characters. Uh, logical operators. Uh, the first one is simply positional. So if we have one piece of a regular expression followed by another, the match is those two things one right after the other. So A followed by B will match AB and only AB. We can put um, a pipe character between two things. Uh, this looks like a vertical bar and just to refresh yourself on most keyboards it is right above the enter key or the return key. 
that is an either or situation. So if I have AB or CD, it will match AB or CD, but not both. And then we can group parts of an expression using parentheses. So for example, A followed by a group B or C followed by D will match A, B, D, or A, C, D. So we have a couple other examples here. What about C followed by the group A or zero, followed by the group B two times or T two times, followed by A, G, E. So let's see, what could we do here? A, C, O, B, B, H should work think. What about CA or OB twice or T twice? Um, so that would probably do uh, somebody else made this one up and I'm let's think through that. It would probably Ah, uh, yeah, I, I, I see how this would go. It would either be CA or OB2 or T2. So it would match CA or it would match OBB or it would match TT, but not uh, any combination of those three, of those things. And applying that logic to the one above, we would match C followed by O, followed by either BB or TT, followed by H. And that gets us things like um, cabbage, cottage, cabbage, cottage, and cot up there. Okay, let's bring some Java-specific things into, into regular expressions. So everything from really from this slide to that slide applies in any programming language that has regular expressions. Um, all of those th I've never seen a, a, an implementation of regular expressions that did not use those basic building blocks. Now here is how, how we deal with these things inside Java itself. <coughs> Excuse me. So any uh, string object in Java has the matches method. And matches takes as its uh, argument a string that looks like a regular expression. And it will return true if the string matches that regular expression. It will return, return false otherwise. So here's an example. We have um, a string day equals January 24th. And we're going to calculate a Boolean result which is equal to day dot matches um, January 24th. So that that should return true because um, the two things are equal. This is interpreted as a regular expression, so it's interpreted as matching a capital J followed by lowercase a, followed by lowercase n, followed by a space, followed by a two, followed by a four. But it will only interpret that um, as an exact regular expression. Um, not a good way to check for quality, but it'll work. A more interesting one here, though, is our, our matches of J, A, N, space, followed by a di any digit, followed by any digit. Um, except that's going to give us an invalid escape sequence. Um, for Java-specific reasons, we have to escape the... Um, the, the, the backslashes as well, so we have to do it this way. And then they did it, this, this last one shows an even more um, useful version where we take um, the, a, an uppercase letter followed by two to seven lowercase letters, um, which will give us a wide range of, of, uh, of month options, followed by um, two digits. Uh, note this won't work for September or for May. Oh, sorry, it'll work for sep it, it won't work for September, it will work for May, but it won't work for May 1st, because we have to have two digits there. And I think we got 
some things here we can look at in um, actual code, yes. So there's several things going on in the code. Um, one applies to the, the conversions earlier, and you can take a look at that. Um, but here's the regular expression demonstration class, and this is available on Moodle if you want to download it. Here we have the string pattern, or the string May 12. We have the pattern that we showed before, a single uppercase letter followed by two to seven lowercase letters. There. Followed by a space, followed by a digit, followed by a digit. So if string matches pattern, we're going to say it matches it. If it does not, we're going to say it doesn't. So if we run this. We do see that, in fact, that May 12 matches the pattern that we gave. Now, if we took away the one, or took away one of the digits, it does not match that pattern, as we said before. And let's change May to September, which has more than um, the, the eight digits allowed here. And note that September 12 does not match the pattern either because the month is too long. Um, some more examples we can use for matches. Um, so if we have ABD as our test string, see if it matches AB or CD. And it will not uh, because um, the, it'll only match AB or CD and not ABD. Now, if our, we change our pattern to A followed by quantity B or C followed by D, then it should in fact match. In fact, let's, uh, let's pull up J shell and, and, and do these. see this first one does not match because ABD does not match AB or CD. And I'm going to change the pattern. And then see if the result matches or if the pattern name matches that pattern and it does in this case because now it's a b d or a c d um, so this is a little tool that you can go to online that checks your regular expressions just to see if uh, things will work out for you so feel free to use that um, and, and with some caveats here so be uh, be careful Okay, a couple exercises here. Write a regular expression where um, you have a pattern of one or more lowercase a's followed by zero or more lowercase b's. So I'll give you a chance to do that. So you might pause, and then I'll write them for you. Okay, now that you've unpaused, let's think about that. So we have one or more lowercase a's. So we have an a followed by a plus, says one or more, followed by zero or more lowercase b's. So a b followed by an asterisk. So one or more lowercase a's followed by zero or more lowercase b's. Oops. Now let's look at the next one. A word of letters only that must start with a capital letter. So I'll give you a minute to think about that and pause. All right, now that you're unpaused and, and have tried this out, let's think through this. So a word of letters that must start with a capital letter. So start, try that first bit. Um, first things first. So must start with a capital letter. Well, that's easy. Use the character class A to Z. 
that ensures that the first thing has to be a capital letter. After that, we want only letters. Now, did it say a specific number of letters? It did not. The only restriction is that it must start uh, in quantity is that it must start with a capital. So let's say A to Z zero or more. So this will match any word uh, that starts with a capital letter even if it's only a single letter. Alright, next one. Something that represents a valid student ID of the form 917 followed by one, two, three, four, five, six digits. So I'm going to pause and let you try that. All right, now that you're unpaused, let's think through that. Valid student ID of the form 917. So it must have 917 at the beginning. And then it must have exactly, well, let's just use the slash D here must have exactly six digits afterwards. Alternately, you could do what I was about to do. Use the 0 to 9 character class. Again, followed by six digits exactly. Both of these would be equivalent. And then the last, one, last example to try, um, telephone number using this exact format. So three digits, dash, three digits, dash, four digits. So I'm going to pause. And now we're back. Let's uh, work through that answer. So the first bit of this is three digits. So let's use our slash D character class with a quantifier of three, followed explicitly by a dash. Then we have three more digits, so we can do slash D with a, a quantifier of three, followed by another dash, followed by four digits. So we can do our slash D, followed by the four quantifier. Um, that's a pretty straightforward version. We could also take this repeating pattern and, and quantify it. So, <coughs> excuse me, we could do Oops, slash D, quantified three. Inside parentheses, actually, the dash after it, inside parentheses with a two, then slash D, quantity four to finish it out. So both of those would be equivalent as well. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about today is formatting output. Um, and you've seen uh, some of this in CS1, I think, with um, string dot, uh, print, uh, for, string dot format, not string dot print, string dot format. Um, we're going to give you a couple more tools uh, to handle some very common cases here. Um, one of them being printing currency. So um, one thing we, we did in CS1 uh, with the tools we had at our disposal, is if we were trying to print out a price, we would hard code in a dollar sign, then inside a string, and then add the, the double at the end. But that would give us weird stuff like this. You know, you might not get specific sense. So one thing we might want to do is to make sure it, um, it truncates to two decimal places, and moreover, that it rounds properly. So here we had um, $1,102 and .0893, which should really be .09 uh, after the decimal place. And so this we want something that rounds properly there. We can do this with a number format class. Um, and it gives us uh, a lot of options for doing common number formats. And even more, it does perform something called localization. So we can uh, ask it to give us a currency format for the United States, for the United Kingdom, for Japan, <coughs> excuse me, for any, for any country that, that has a known um, uh, currency style. And it, it will just do that for us automatically. Um, and it can even do it, we can say, for uh, a Java program, 
we can ask it what locale it's running on and have it format based on that. We don't have to be specific. We can simply say, look at the computer you're running on, see if it knows where it's located, and um, give me uh, a format based on that. So here's an example. We have our double, and we're going to grab a number format for doing US currency. So we need a number format object and we have a static method on number format called get currency instance and we pass it a locale, in this case locale.us <clears throat> and we can use that currency formatter to format a double and it will give us something like that. And I think we probably have a some examples of this here. All right. Um, in formatter we have a test currency that's doing what we just said. We have a double that comes out to something that's not very nice looking, has, probably has a lot of things after the decimal place. We grab our um, currency in, instance from number format based on the US locale and we're printing it to the con printing that price to the console using that formatter. And when we do that, this is the, the line that outputs. So just like we saw before. So let's change it up. We'll make that 37 and that 59. We'll see if that changes things. And it sure did. Our price is uh, changed up now. <coughs> Excuse me, I've been talking too long. Uh, we also have some examples of doing it for percentage. Um, so we've done the same thing in test percentage where we grab the get percent instance based on um, how we represent things here in the United States. And we're going to format that using percentages. And so that's what we get here. And the last one we're going to take a look at is the decimal format class. It lets us specify a pattern for how we want our decimals to look. Um, and this is going to be similar if you've um, used uh, Microsoft Excel to format decimals and currencies and things uh, inside a cell. You've seen these kinds of patterns before. So here we have a double value which has three things past the uh, the decimal point um, and put in actually three things in front of what would be the thousands place. So we're going to create a new decimal format object that says we have a number uh, there has a comma in front of the first three or the hundreds place, has a decimal point after the ones, and then has two digits max after the decimal point. So we're going to call format on that object, passing in our double value, then we're going to print it out. And notice that it takes our double, puts a comma in between uh, the thousands and hundred place, puts a decimal uh, after the ones, and it properly rounds to two uh, digits afterwards. Uh, one thing that we'll, um, we have to be cautious about here is if we didn't have additional decimal places here, it would not give us a zero out to the end. If you want zeros, you have to change the, the pound signs to zeros like that. So let's take a look at that here. So we have our, our test with 123456.789 as our double value. We're going to format it using what we saw before and print that out. And we get the comma in the proper place, the decimal in the proper place, and it rounded our, our two digits like we wanted them to. Let's remove the 8-9 here, run it, and notice that the, the pound signs say that the zeros are, don't, don't print out, at the, or the trailing zeros don't print out, so we don't have that there. If, if we want the trailing zeros, we put two zeros there and run it again and now it, it prints out the trailing zeros for us. Um, if you want to learn how to do a particular format, look at the API and it'll give you some ideas of, of what you need to do to make certain things happen. 
All right, wrapping things up, we've talked about uh, type conversions today we, uh, from string to int, and, or string to primitives and primitives to strings. Uh, we've talked about regular expressions and we've talked about formatting output. Uh, in the next class, we are going to talk about something called arrays, a special data type in Java. As always, if you have questions, ask me or Dr. Yang and we will be glad to help.